I am excited to introduce our speaker, Dr. Richard Muller. Before I cite some of his many accomplishments, I would like to give you some background information about this plenary. In January 2011, a grant was awarded to Project Kaleidoscope by FIPSI. The goal of this grant is to incorporate real-world issues into the undergraduate STEM curriculum. To move in this direction, Project Kaleidoscope is working with 11 disciplinary societies, of which AAPT is one. Our action item was to invite Dr. Muller to be a speaker. With fortune on our side, he agreed and is here today. Rich has been Professor of Physics at UC Berkeley for four decades and is a recipient of the 1982 MacArthur Prize. His research career has spanned the cosmic microwave background, supernovae, geomagnetic reversals, fossil extinctions, and currently global warming. He has had numerous PhD students and postdocs. In that list, I recognize Saul Perlmutter, who is this year's recipient of the Nobel Prize in Physics, and Sean Carlson, who founded the Society for Amateur Scientists and wrote a column called The Amateur Scientist in Scientific American. Rich, you and your students have made an impact. The reason Rich is here today is because of a course that he taught at Berkeley in 2000, since 2000, entitled Physics for Future Presidents, a course that relates concepts in physics to global events and issues. This course was twice voted by students as best class at Berkeley. Webcasts and podcasts were made available. They had been watched by people all over the world, including soldiers stationed in Iraq. Two books resulted from this course, a college textbook, and a popular version, perfect for reading by presidential hopefuls and journalists. The popular, the popular version is available here for purchase at this meeting. We are rich, we are excited to hear about your views. Thank you so much for coming. Delighted to be here. It's really wonderful to be surrounded by people, each of whom is passionate about teaching and knows the issues and problems in teaching physics. When I was a, uh, asked to teach the Physics for Poets class, that's what it was called, I, I really didn't want to. I taught almost every other physics course at Cal. But this intimidated me. I, I, I didn't know how to approach someone who found math to be burdensome. Uh, but then I realized I actually knew a lot of such people. I've been pretty active as a consultant working for, uh, for, for, for 43 years. I was a high level uh, consultant on national security. I would vote my summers instead of going off to uh, research conferences, to working on national security issues, talking to generals and, 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 uh, and admirals and so on, uh, and addressing the problems that they had. And I realized these were among the smartest people I'd ever met in my life. But most of them were kind of afraid of physics. Now, how could that be? What's the contradiction here? I began to realize the problem wasn't with them, it was with us. It's with we physics teachers. We love to teach the future physicists, love to nurture them becoming the next, well, in my case, the Valorian kind of nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that's a great thrill to do something like that. But the student who is a little bit mathematically inept, um, they, they may become the world leader someday. They may become U.S. president. And certainly a president of a corporation. I got to know a lot of the people outside of the military, too. The people who did incredible things in business. I can tell you stories about how the smartest people I know are not physicists. Uh, they are businessmen. I have great admiration for them. I know a lot of them. And the things they do are, they, I, again, I, I don't want to go off and tell you the stories about how smart they are. But, they were so grateful to have someone they could talk to who understood physics. 
There was a thirst for physics. They love physics, but they can't talk to a physicist because we're so intimidating. Intimidating to someone who has created a billion dollar company? Yeah. There's something scary about physics. And a lot of it is our fault. It was my fault. It was because we tend to uh, emphasize how beautiful physics is. Well, look, I, I, when I was asking to do this course, I interviewed all the people who were still around with what the course before. And let me summarize what I ran into. This is my parody of the physics professor teaching the course that became physics and future presidents prior to me teaching. So this is, this is just a parody. Okay. So you are the class. You are the non-math lovers. Okay, well, welcome to Taking Physics. I'm glad you signed up for this tough course. Of course, we'll water it down a lot so that you don't have to really be challenged too much. Uh, you're, you're not smart enough to be able to really understand real physics, but don't worry about that. We won't take real physics. All I really aspire to do in this class is to get you to know the scientific method so that you will recognize real physicists when they use it. And so he'll be a little bit jealous of us. Uh, I mean, none of them ever said that. But you could sense it in their attitudes. They referred to the course as the physics for poets. Now, I know poetry is nice. I love poetry. I recite a whole bunch of poems from memory. But the idea that you're aiming at poets, and of course, they didn't always say that. Sometimes we use physics for jocks. Right? So what does that mean to anybody? What does it mean to a jock? And you have to recognize that jocks become U.S. senators. <laughs> and some of them become presidents. Why? And they're not smart. The well, fact is, they are smart. They're just smart in a different dimension. And these are people who run circles around me in terms of understanding how to organize large organizations and groups of people to do things very effectively in very innovative ways. I see jobs at the college dropout, right? I wonder if he ever took a physics course. It's one of the few people I wish I had never did. Um, so, so, so what's going on here? You're these super smart people, and what do we do? We try to create, we, we, we want, all we really want to do is to get you next to Nobel Lord. That's all we want to do. Um, and and that's, that's terrible. People who major in physics form two categories. We're all aware of this in Berkeley. There are the ones who are going to go on and become physics professors. And they're the ones who are going to what? Become teachers? Become high school teachers? Where are the rest? If you major in English, does it mean you're going to be a professor of English? No, you major in English because it's a great thing to major in, or history, or all these other subjects, economics. Everybody needs to know economics. Well, everybody needs to know physics. Why is it that how we have 100 physics majors at a huge university and not 1,000, not 10,000? Why is that? Because we don't teach physics for the people who will become the world leaders. And we try to intimidate them. We keep our classes small. We like having small classes. Uh, you know, hey, only, I, I have only 20 students this semester. That's great. Glad we don't have no physics majors. So uh, and, and there's a sort of snobbery about it, and I think we do a great disservice. I would like to see physics become the most popular major at Cal. But if we're going to do that, it can't be a pre-professional class. It has to be a class in which we teach the physics that they need to know. Now, how can we do that about math? Is physics and math synonymous? Well, a lot of people feel that way. And I don't. Uh, as someone who has brought up lots of graduate students, and train them. The biggest problem you have when you're a new graduate student is that the graduate student tries to turn every problem you give them into a math problem. If you can turn it into an equation, you can solve it. If you had that experience when you were in seventh grade, maybe the same experience I had. Uh, what well, other people were hating math. I love simultaneous equations. Here were these impossible to solve problems. You know, someone going down a river where the river is flowing, going across, just impossible to solve. But if you wrote down equations and you had the same number of equations as you had unknowns, you could solve them. I suspect to many in the room, this was a great, exciting moment. It was to me. 